What the, are we going to start now? Yeah, well, I mean, I am live right now, just so you're aware, oh, okay. so you don't say anything too outrageous and controversial. Mm. Um, but you can, yeah. we can take a moment to get everything set up properly, etc. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm just, you know, as usual, because this happens to me every time, I struggle a little with my headphones. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Do. Have you been listening to anything on those headphones lately? I, I saw on Twitter... You mentioned you were getting back into Asia, the Steely, the classic Steely Dan album. Have you been listening to I, that? It's interesting, but because I really, really, um, I like some of that kind of music, partly because um, I know they're both. What's his name? Donald Fagan and the other guy. Yeah, they're super good Walter guitar. Becker. I like to pick up my guitar and play along and see how I do. Um, yeah. So I can't play along with that kind of stuff. It's too it's too complicated. It's too complex. It is complex. I don't have the chops. No, nor do I, but <laughs> I enjoy fooling around. And uh yeah, super enjoy fooling around. Yeah, um, well, same. You know, uh yeah, no no. Listen, I, I I don't even want to pretend that I know what I'm doing. So <laughs> I can't even get my headphones to work. Come on, man. Uh you know. Yeah, okay. I got to stop thinking about this. Uh, so, how are things with you? Well, things are going okay, VJ. Thanks for asking. Um, you know, uh it's this is now so this is interesting because this is now the third time we've spoken and each conversation has been separated by around a year's time. So, it's been kind of fascinating to a lot has happened in those 2 years. So, um it's going to it's going to be interesting to to catch up with you. Uh, based on everything that's changed since the last time we spoke, I guess to just to start off, the most important news story right now that I wanted to see if you could weigh in on was the Kate Middleton situation. Are you following this? Are you following this conspiracy with um, the royal family? And do you care at all what happens with the royal family? Prince Charles, now King Charles, waited his whole life. You know, his wife, his mother kept living on and on and on, and then she dies. He becomes king, and then cancer. Um, on top of the fact that, you know, his whole family is falling apart because his sons don't get along, blah, 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 blah. And then the Kate Middleton photogra photograph scandal. I mean, you know, it's a gift that keeps on giving. Um, I know there's illness here, so one shouldn't be too flippant. You know, people are sick, perhaps, and X, Y, Z. But, man, you know, that particular family... Um, you know, television shows have been made of it. Uh, and people have made a lot of money on them. Now, they've also made a lot of money on the British taxpayer and the British Empire. So my tears are not all that liquid. Um, yeah, but this is a strange story. It, it has a lot to do with the culture that we live in, the culture of public relations, managing expectations, controlling the storyline, you know, what's sometimes called spin. Um, a lot of this is about management of image and so on. And I don't think Kate Middleton or the British, um, you know, family of the Windsors, or they are not alone in this, right? Um, this is really a, a problem of, of, I mean, you're Canadian, yeah, right? That's right. And your prime minister has twice run into a certain PR problem. Once he was schooled like a little boy by Xi Jinping. <laughs> and then after Xi Jinping turned his back on him, Justin Trudeau sort of was looking around going, where's my entourage? Yeah. And had to skulk just, off. Just kind of slunk through, away. Yeah, that was fantastic. Yeah, through stage rear, you know. And then recently, and I don't know when this video footage was shot, he was in Putin's face. And he touched Putin and some Russian security guard, don't want to mess with them, uh, started walking towards him. And you see Putin sort of lifting his hand in a gesture like, it's okay, I can take care of this. Um, <laughs> I can handle I don't this know guy. if you saw that, that. That, you know, maybe it's an old video, but it recirculated. And, you know, Justin Trudeau has really an image problem because at least in the circles I roam in, um, you know, his pretty boy face doesn't win him the kind of points it perhaps used to win when he was in boarding school or wherever, you know? Um, yeah, man. I mean, 
managing image and brands and expectation and all that stuff um it's it's a feat uh i feel for people who have to do all that yeah well this for me it's just the whole kate middleton thing it's been kind of with all the serious news going on that we're all paying attention to and the nonstop horrors that we're seeing it just felt like a little bit of a fun escapist exercise to speculate on what weird reasons this kind of stuff's going on and looking at these little breadcrumbs and these kind of conspiracy uh, clues, you know, it's just been kind of an enjoyable little exercise. I mean, what's fun is how many brilliant people there are online, metadata experts, you know, people with strange um, online names um, talking about how the Royal family just won't release the original picture so that metadata can be studied and so on. Um, <laughs> That's fascinating. Our culture is fascinating. Yeah. No end of something interesting going on, you know, at some point. Yeah, man. I mean, uh, at each instance, there's an interesting thing happening. The United States. I mean, what an election. What a fascinating uh, glance at, at the people that are back for, you know, it's basically like Ali and Frazier. Um, they're back, you know. <laughs> yeah. The fight Round continues. Two. Yeah, it's 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 going to be. Uh, he's challenging him again. Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? Um, one man, you know, sort of ro roaming around the rink, saying, "Man, I, I've been hit too many times," and the other guy just, you know, he doesn't know who he's hitting. He's hitting the post. He's hitting the coach. Uh, he's hitting everything. Um, both, in a sense, blinded by reality, right? Yeah. And and you know, and we got the fate of the world in the balance, and the United States just can't seem to put up, you know, a candidate that anybody can respect. Um, fear, maybe. Uh, feel compassion for, maybe. But respect, I don't think so. And, you know, I travel a lot. I was in Tunisia. I was in, in Ghana and so on. And people just, you know, it's, it's, you know, half a tick away from just laughing in utter mockery. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like the country with the largest military in the world, has a kind of buffoonish ability to put up terrible candidates for the highest office. And, you know, that it says a lot. You know, as I say, our culture has, you know, every day is a picnic for this kind of stuff. And, of course, all of this is in the context of what's happening in Gaza, which is not funny at all. No. Um, and But simultaneous, you know, these hilarities are taking place and then there's this genocidal thing happening. Yeah? Well, it... it I mean, I, I had meant to kind of get into this a little bit later, but now that you brought it up, I think it's a good question to to ask, which is that when it comes to this like rematch now with Joe Biden and Donald Trump, do you think this could be possibly the most perfect, most fitting election for kind of an empire in this sort of state of terminal decline like America seems to be right now? It really is indicative of a, of a lot, really, isn't it? When you see these two, these two heavyweights uh, going head to head and with the threat of American democracy apparently at, at stake. It's a really important thing to be concerned about, you know, and why? I mean, the United States is just one country in the world. There's about, what, 193, 194 countries. Um, the United States is not anything special. It's just another place. On the other hand, the U.S. has the largest military in the world. And if you add up all the NATO countries and North Korea, uh, South Korea and and Japan, you add up all the military budgets, um, annual military spending, the United States and its bloc accounts for 75% of global military spending. 75%, okay? Um, this is in a study that our team did, a text we published called Hyper Imperialism. We looked at the numbers and, you know, like the Stockholm Institute, which is often the benchmark on military spending, really deflates US military spending. They don't look at most of the nuclear weapons spending, which is in the Department of Energy and so on. We looked at it closely, 75%. So, yes, there is some sort of decline. But, you know, you still have a, a big military and a major, um, you know, a use of this military through its allies to have influence in the world, sometimes terrible influence. I mean, the United States might be a country that finds it easier to blow bridges up rather than build bridges. That's true. On the other hand, it can still blow bridges up. And that's a concern. So is it a decline of the United States? In a sense, yes. 
there's a decline of the economy economic control for sure that there, there's a decline in in standing you know people just don't as i said earlier respect um the leadership of the united states they may have respected or feared them earlier they don't either despite the fact that the us has such a vast military arsenal you know can really wreck havoc anywhere in the world and that's scary you know um i mean biden's behavior during this whole um you know pummeling of gaza has been disgraceful a uh, continuing to rearm israel right through it um is a disgrace i mean the united kingdom another one of these countries with a pretense to democracy i mean hey listen we used to laugh and say is the mother of all parliaments you know westminster um yeah, i used to say i used to laugh and say that now the laughter is not just you know those of us who are um critics of the british and the british empire but i mean when the scottish national party put up a ceasefire resolution in the house of commons um there was pandemonium i i don't know if you followed this but the speaker of the house tried to scuttle a vote on the scottish national party um you know uh, vote you know their bill or not bill their their resolution for the house to vote on on a ceasefire in gaza and because neither the conservatives nor labor wanted to go on the record um they tried to use the speaker to scuttle it and the speaker lost his 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 own sense of of unbiasedness you know um comical you know that these people they can't even they can't even come out directly and say something like you know we need a ceasefire but but while they prevaricate on the question of ceasefire they're arming the israelis so all of this you know is making a mockery of the west but the west nonetheless retains enormous military power and that's scary man i mean the very fact that um, uh, emmanuel macron can jokingly or maybe seriously say that french troops or european troops should enter ukraine or that the united states periodically talks about the defense of taiwan putting missiles in taiwan all of this should give people pause you know um, these are wars we just don't need yeah well i mean especially talking about taiwan similar to ukraine china has has indicated over and over and over again that that's a red line for them and we ignored these red lines in ukraine and continued pushing and pushing and pushing until it provoked this this uh this war now that's ongoing for 2 years and yeah there seems to be factions within the uh the power structures in the west that are seem determined to follow that exact same course of action like despite the fact that like it hasn't led to the result that i think that they were hoping for uh in ukraine uh but like you said i think uh yeah we can talk about the us empire being in decline i think it's something it's an interesting subject to kind of uh talk about but like you mentioned um still retains enormous power and it's almost even it's a really dangerous and fraught situation to see this kind of like uh this empire losing its legitimacy still heavily armed and with this very kind of paranoid and violent sort of world view can lead to all kinds of uh really horrific outcomes for everyone you know i i i've been thinking recently rob about geography i mean very basic geography um you know looking at maps studying um you know the kind of historical and cultural relations amongst people Th- this has always interested me but recently i was just playing around um you know there's some obvious things okay ukraine is always going to live next to russia that's just going to be the case right yeah um i joked last year saying you know ukraine cannot be airlifted to iowa it's not going to happen they're always going to live next to russia ukrainians can move as people but the country or the territory of ukraine can't be moved it's always going to live next to russia the palestinians are always going to live next to whatever you know happens in israel whether israel is going to become a um, a binational democratic state or maintain its uh, you know apartheid like situation as an as a jewish state with palestinians living within a second class citizen whatever it decides they going to have to live next to each other you know you can't actually evict uh, 2.3 million people from gaza and not expect them to be living in the sinai looking over the fence again you know they're not going further than that okay you're going to have to live with each other taiwan is always going to have to live next to china again 
Taiwanese people can go and live in Los Angeles if they want, but the island of Taiwan is always going to have to be near China. Also, Cuba is always going to be 90 miles away from the United States. And yet, there are these exaggerations, you know, uh, let's go and weaken Russia through Ukraine, putting the Ukrainians who are going to always have to live next to Russia in a kind of long-term danger, you know, why exacerbate it to the point of war? Uh, and you know that this war is not going to go well for anybody because both are going to have to live side by side. Um, the Israelis, the United States have to recognize that Palestine is not going anywhere. You're going to have to come to a modus vivendi of some kind. You're going to have to have some way of living with each other. Same with Taiwan. And the interesting thing is the warmongers, whether it's in NATO headquarters in Brussels or in Washington, D.C. at the Pentagon or the White House or wherever the hell they are in Tel Aviv, the warmongers uh, don't seem to want to recognize this elementary fact that you know any child should be able to uh, recognize is that when you look at the map, you can't move these places. You know, you can embargo Cuba as much as you want, but Cuba is going to live 90 miles away from the U.S. And you might as well have a decent human relationship uh, between Washington and, and Havana, you know, to constantly attempt to overthrow the government. Of, and Havana is souring a relationship that need not be sour. You're going to have to live next to each other. Um, and so, I mean... You know, for whatever ideology and ideological standpoint people have, um, this idea of needing to live side by side is important. You know, this summer in, in July, uh, I'm going to release a book which I wrote with Noam Chomsky called On Cuba. It's a very slim book. And you, you'll find this part funny because it relates to Canada. There was a time in the 1990s when the United States government uh, really pushed hard for tertiary sanctions saying that, you know, they would sanction a third country or a third um, company, uh, not a U.S. company, but like, say, uh, any other, like Canada, for instance, if Canada had relations with Cuba and if a Canadian company had relations, it would be sanctioned. So in the Canadian parliament, a jokester parliamentarian put up a bill talking about um, reparations for Canadians who had lost their properties um, <laughs> when the United States, you know, defeated Canada and whatever it is, 1812 or, you know, and said that if these properties aren't written, those who benefited from them will be sanctioned. And that went through the commons in Canada. I mean, it's funny. You may laugh at it, you know, but in fact, what this Canadian jokester did, and by the way, it would be really funny for you to find that parliamentarian and bring them on your show. I think that would be quite an interesting um, exercise because I'm sure they have interesting things to say. But, um, you know, that was not all fun and games because they just mirrored what the U.S. is doing to Cuba. Um, people need to live side by side. It's ridiculous. You know, the Canadians could say that, you know, you took a, there's some island out near Vancouver, right, between the U.S. and Canada where there was actually a milit armed conflict in the 19th century uh, over this island. It's something like the Falkland Islands, you know, it's a small, tiny little island. Few people live there, but the U.S. and Canada continued to contest whose island that was. Um, you got to live side by side. These things have to be settled. Border disputes, such as like between India and China, border disputes uh, have terrible ramifications. And to exacerbate the border dispute, right, Taiwan or Ukraine or Cuba and so on, um, that seems to me extremely reckless and horrible and ugly. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and not only are these like geographical realities, uh, immutable and unchangeable, but just like focusing on, uh, on Palestine, this idea that like, Oh, we just need to defeat Hamas. And that's why Israel has this perpetual right to defend itself because Hamas is so terrible and evil. And once Israel just, simply defeats Hamas, that's when the bombing will stop, that's when the violence will stop, that's when finally there will be some kind of peaceful resolution. While ignoring the like incredibly, like this generational effect that this conflict is going to have for the Palestinian children, for example, that are lucky enough to survive this, we've seen tens of thousands of children murdered over the last six months, they're not going to grow up to have anti-Israel sentiment, they're not going to grow up to join the next 
armed uh, group that uh, is is interested in fighting back against Israel. Like the idea that this is just some situation. America found this out over the 20 years of the war on terror that you can just kill all your enemies, bomb them into a, into submission, into oblivion, and then you're going to have some kind of peaceful uh, status quo that's left over. It's just completely delusional. I mean, if anything, Israel has ensured that for the next generation, there will continue to be uh, Palestinians that are going to engage in armed struggle against the occupation. And I think anyone with a conscience that can look over at what's been happening would totally understand anyone that would make that decision. Um, so it just, it's a completely nonsensical idea that you can just like bomb your way out of this problem and not just create significantly more problems uh, in the future. Well, first, I mean, you, you raised really important thoughts and questions there. So let, let me just spend time on two of them, if that's okay. The yeah. first is Hamas, you know, um, this obsession with Hamas is interesting. So firstly, Hamas was founded in 1987. Um, that's 50 years after this conflict had already begun. If we take the uprising, the Palestinian uprising of 36, 37 as a marker. Um, if you take 1917, the Balfour Declaration, when the British imperialists basically said, you know, you who are victims of European anti-Semitism, we don't want to deal with you. We actually want Jews out of Europe, so why don't you go and settle in, in Palestine? That was the Balfour Declaration, 1917. Um, so that's 70 years later that Hamas is founded. Um, Hamas didn't start this conflict. It's a child of this conflict. Um, so to now focus on the child of this conflict and say that's the reason for this conflict is actually a basic category error. Um, there is a, a problem here. But it's not Hamas. Hamas is a product of the problem. It's not the problem itself. So that's one, you know. And, and OK, people may disagree about this or that aspect of Hamas. I, I mean, I've interviewed uh, people, high officials of, of various organizations from Palestine, and they all say that, you know, you don't understand. They say um, now with the conditions deteriorating, and this is before 2023, uh, Hamas is actually a moderating influence. There are far more radical organizations growing out of desperation and frustration. So, you know, people should uh, think twice about delegitimizing Hamas. You know, first Israel delegitimized the Fatah organization. Then they delegitimized the PLO. Then they de de delegitimized the Palestinian Authority. Then they delegitimized Hamas. I mean, where are you going with this? Be careful what you do, I say to the occupiers. That's one issue. You know, this obsession with Hamas is a category error. That's not the problem. That's a product of the problem. You know, that's that's one issue here. Um, the other issue is this issue of, you know, this violence is so horrible and ugly. Not only has it produced um, a kind of, of generational uh, sentiment against Israel within Palestine, it has produced that among young people globally. There are young yeah. people marching around the world uh, many of them with very little previous political experience who have been radicalized. And for them, as I see it, as I listen to the slogans and uh, participated in demonstrations in different countries, in, in Paris and places, you know, I, I watched young people uh, make demands that are not just about Israel and Palestine, but about the arms trade, about Western complicity. In other words, these are young people who are moving in a direction of anti-imperialism. And so that's another generation, you know, of young people in their 20s and so on, who are going to remember this forever, you know, for, for the length of their, of their life. I mean, you know, this war is radicalizing a lot of people in the West. And I don't think this is properly understood. Like, take the United States again, New York City, the Palestinian Youth Movement, the People's Forum, and hundreds of other organizations sustained Diesel's demonstration at the New York Times building in Times Square, marching down the street, shutting this down, shutting Brooklyn Bridge down, young people in Los Angeles shutting down the freeway at the port of San Francisco, small towns in Indiana, and so on. Um, this is serious. Then a large number of people vote uncommitted in the Democratic primary in Michigan. Serious stuff. Many of them young people 
Uh, I spoke at the rally in Washington DC in November. Uh, I was happened to be the last speaker, which has a great advantage to it because I got to listen to everybody, and also I could talk to people as they came off the stage. And a number of the leaders of Arab American organizations in November said, "We are not going to tell our people to vote for Biden." That was in November. It's much worse now. Um, and but Mr. Biden can lose the election. Uh, on this issue, he may lose it on other things: his age, the state of the economy, um, the way Trump is able to galvanize people. All of those things are negative for Mr. Biden. But the Gaza situation, the complicity of the U.S. is even more. So, yeah, you know, I mean, it's not just Palestinians who are going to continue their fight for national liberation. That's there. That I think is correct. What you said, but also. A generation is moving away from the consensus now. Where they go, I don't know, but they've certainly been radicalized. They've been moved to participate in non-stop demonstrations and so on. That doesn't go anywhere, you know. And and I must say, the Israeli um, propaganda wings outside Israel, you know, in in the United States, Canada, this argument that protesting against Israel is anti-Semitic is fraying rapidly. People are not buying it anymore. No. Um, you know, I've experienced this personally. Of course, you know, was very much in my a job I had where the Anti-Defamation League came in and complained, said he's anti-Semitic, this that. I was warned several times. I got into serious trouble uh, on this issue. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, far worse than my petty situation, um, lost the leadership of the British Labour Party on this issue. Very, uh, you know, malevolent use of. The idea of anti-Semitism. The curiosity is that actual anti-Semites in Britain, Richard Seymour, who calls himself a white Zionist, these are actual anti-Semites, Nazis, uh, you know, salutes and so on. These people are now pro-Israel. This is a curiosity that those who are anti um, the violence of the Israeli military are called anti-Semitic, but real anti-Semites, Pastor James Hagee in the United States, Richard Seymour in the UK, and so on. These people are celebrated as friends of Israel, but they are real Nazis and they are real anti-Semites. So there is a strange, bizarre thing going on, you know. But I would say, on uh, at the bottom, um, millions and millions of young people have been radicalized out of this. And honestly, I see that as a little silver lining. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is something that I've been as long as I've been paying attention to this, and that the first incident that really kind of radicalized me on this was following the uh the freedom flotilla which was i believe black back in 2010 and then seeing israel's response to that and then seeing the way that the media talked about it and been following like each kind of successive sort of incident uh the the gaza war in 2014 the great march of return and various other kind of incidents and seeing this kind of shift over the last 20 uh you know 10 15 years about the way that this is talked about i think is really interesting and the way that the the usual ways that our Western leaders are able to kind of like uh, support Israel and what they do while also kind of maintaining some position like they stand for peace or anything, using this kind of language about Israel's right to defend itself. This is what they always come out with, like every every time Israel creates, commits some horrific atrocity or act of criminality, this is what happens. Um Using this kind of like language about anti-Semitism and trying to delegitimize protests to it, it just really seems like people are not buying this anymore, um, which I think is a really interesting kind of development. And um, you, I mean, you see, because you've got two liberal administrations right now in, in Canada and the United States who have been fully supporting this. And it's interesting as well how they've been trying to take this kind of hand-wringing approach. Oh, we're so concerned about this. Uh, we're so, you know, we're very alarmed. We've had tough conversations while simultaneously arming and funding Israel while they do this, not really meaningfully doing anything to curtail their ability to wage this war and to engage in this kind of criminality. And it seems like this this effort to kind of play both sides or to suggest that they're standing for peace or they're, or they're still standing for something like a two-state solution, even when the Israeli government is very open about how the fact that they are not interested in that whatsoever, Um it's interesting how this is failing to connect with people as well. And you still have, no matter, no matter you might know, have Joe Biden's lackeys out there giving these press conferences, talking about how concerned they are or whatever, this is not really meaning anything to anyone. You still have people engaging in this uncommitted campaign in the primary. You still have people protesting Biden events. 
um, with no signs of stopping. So it just really does seem like there's been this kind of fundamental shift over the last six months where the usual tactics that are used by our Western leaders to kind of whitewash their participation in this are just kind of not really having the same impact or effect uh, that they maybe once did. You know, these things are connected. I mean, where, where we started the conversation is connected to this. Um, yes, I mean, this, you know, prevarication, hand-wringing, you called it. This is frustrating for people, you know, um, because it just seems like a lack of moral clarity. You know, either either you're calling for a ceasefire or you're not. To talk about sustainable ceasefire, humanitarian pause, all of this sounds like gobbledygook. You know, this is... This is the peanuts, you know, the parents talking. Ba -ba 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 -ba. <laughs> um, it doesn't make sense, guys. You you know, young people are saying we would like some moral clarity on this. And I wonder, I wonder very much if there'll be a spillover effect from this. That people will then say, Oh, okay, we're talking about United States being the greatest country in the world. Well, the greatest country in the world, a great city like Santa Monica and Los Angeles, why are there so many homeless people living right next to the beach? Um, that's also a demand for moral clarity. Maybe it'll go in that direction. That's why I said it's hard to tell where this radicalization goes. You know, if you're asking for clarity on the question of Israel and Palestine, will you ask for clarity on other questions? You know, I mean, it's ridiculous that rich countries like the U.S. have such poor health care systems, so expensive, you know, and so on. Will there be that? In other words, will there be a new movement talking about a new dispensation, a new organization of reality. How can rich countries be so poor and so on? Asking moral clarity. I think that's that could be a real challenge in, in this world. But, go, you know, I said it circles back to the beginning because it, it does revolve around the idea that, man, man, I mean, let me ask you a question. Um, do, you, do you respect any of the Western leaders? I mean, if I asked you, Rob, can you name the Chancellor of Germany? Uh, oh, it's not Merkel. She just left. Yeah, man. Uh, you know, exactly, right? Yeah. You have no... Don't put me on the spot idea. like this, VJ. Yeah, no, you no, no. You embarrass no. me. I, I, no, it's not embarrassing. <laughs> because let me tell you, 99% of people who follow every damn thing will have no idea what the guy's name is. His name is Olaf Schulz. And he is basically a nothing um, because he is essentially taking orders from Washington and from wealthy bondholders in Germany, you know, who are not even investing in the DAX index. You know, the, the wealthy in Germany in, are investing in Wall Street. So, in fact, you could say right now the chancellor uh, of Germany is perhaps Joe Biden um, or somebody. But it's definitely not Olaf Schulz. He's not Angela Merkel. Angela Merkel didn't agree with that lady at all on most things, but she was somebody to respect, man. She would have read the briefing documents, right? You remember her name, right. you know? You said it's not Merkel, I know that. Some guy out there, I don't know who he is, but it's not Merkel. Well, but that proves my point, right? You, you remember Merkel, again, I, I don't agree with Merkel, I thought, I didn't really agree, agree with any of her politics, but for God's sake, at least I... She made a mark, you know. This guy, no mark. Emmanuel Macron, the only mark he makes is similar to the mark Justin Trudeau makes, you know. They sort of truck on the fact that they are conventionally, at least, you know, by some standards, nice-looking guys or whatever, you know. Um, you know, I mean, for God's sake, what has Macron or Trudeau done uh, in terms of their record that's, that's, you know, that makes you feel like, wow, that's interesting or inspirational. Nothing. I mean, these are placeholders for the bankers. You know, um, Justin Trudeau is a replaceable a stooge of the banking industry um, and the mining industry in Canada. Mediocre. Uh, mediocre, yeah. <laughs> and Emmanuel Macron is, again, just a placeholder uh, for the French, um, you know, elite sector. These are placeholder people. Olaf Scholz, Justin Trudeau, um, you know, Emmanuel Macron. To some extent, Rishi Sunak, he's genuinely a placeholder. You know, I mean, he, he didn't even win an election. I mean, the guy is nothing. Empty suit, you know. And worse, who is going to come in from Labour? Keir Starmer. I mean, another empty suit, you know. I mean, there's none of these, none of them 
I'm scared of Gert Wilders in Netherlands because he's a fascist. Um, but none of the major leaders of the West are at all people that you can admire, you know. And that says a lot because you combine that, that obvious mediocrity of the leaders. Biden doesn't know where he is half the time, you know. And there's a kind of elder abuse at work in the Biden camp. The guy yeah. should be allowed to retire, man. I mean, you know, I don't want to make fun of him because it's not him that's the problem. It's people around him. You know, this is a this is cruelty to a man who's you know needs to he needs to get out of there. You know, it's ridiculous. Um, yeah. I mean, these are not people that inspire hope in anything. You know, uh, and so then you know. There's a statement made, well, you know, Putin is a strong man uh, or Xi Jinping is a strong man. Well, compared to Trudeau and compared to placeholders like Macron, they actually have a personality. Now, again, you might not like their politics. Um, I happen to like Xi Jinping's politics, may not like their politics, but they certainly Same. make an impression, right? Yeah. Um, and so, well... Because the West is unable to produce even one leader that makes an impression, apart from the impression that Donald Trump makes, which is an impression that suggests run away quickly from him because he'll either pinch your ass or he's going to throw you in jail. Scary guy. Um, you know, then you turn to these other people and say, well, they are the problem. No, guys, you are the problem. Your mediocrity combined with your lack of moral compass, your duplicity when it comes to these wars, the suffering in Ukraine, the suffering in, in Gaza and so on. Um, wow. You know, I mean, imagine you're a young person in a Western country. It must be depressing. Um, yeah. Super, super I'm not exactly depressing. young, yeah. but I would say, yes, it is. Um, no, okay. So there's a couple of things there that I wanted to respond to. First of all, I think like I appreciate being generous towards Biden. I don't have quite as much sympathy for Biden because of the absolute carnage that he's totally sus uh, justified and subsidized over the last six months. Something that he seems like he's proud to do. He's one of the most proudly open liberal Zionists uh, in the United States government in that, in that time. And there might be a possibility where there's like a, someone in the democratic party that might have a different view of that, that might've done something by now that Biden has not done. So not a ton, not a ton of sympathy for uh, grandpa Joe there. Um, and I think focusing on Germany is actually a really interesting example because I think it's bizarre almost Germany's role in perpetuating this genocidal campaign in Gaza and using their history of being this fascist, anti-Semitic, genocidal society as if it gives them some kind of authority and that they need to subsidize this violence because that shows how serious they are about uh, making up for this past, making up for past wrongs. Meanwhile, you have them like they're arresting Jewish activists under these like draconian laws to defend against anti-Semitism. And they're kind of lecturing everyone else about how supportive to Jewish people they are now. And they show that by, you know, helping mass murder tens of thousands of little children in uh, in, in Palestine. Um, also, uh, just when you talk about Germany's role, just basically being uh, a a insignificant junior partner of the U.S. empire. I think on Ukraine, that's another interesting example where you have um, um, the United States literally being responsible for bombing their energy infrastructure. Like they've deliberately crippled their own uh, energy independence and sovereignty and deindustrialized basically at the behest of the United States, which has been a disaster for people that actually live there. They've seen their energy costs shoot up. They don't have access to this cheap Russian gas anymore that they once did. And it's just amazing the way that these countries have just been able to like uh, sell this to people that, that live there, just totally kind of sacrificing their own security and sovereignty at the altar of, of U.S. imperialism. It's, it's really remarkable that this is allowed to happen. And it's just been a gift to the far right in a lot of these places. It's the far right in Germany now that is like on the, on the rise. And this is part of the reason why that's happening. Um, <laughs> sorry, I have to get some water, but, um, you know, this is a fascinating, um, conversation, the conversation about Germany, because there's two ways to get to this. One is the issue of, um, Israel itself. I mean, uh, it's so interesting how 
Germany has never really come to terms with the Holocaust. And it's never come to terms with a long history of anti-Semitism. You know, it's not just the Holocaust. In the 19th century, German intellectuals, respected intellectuals, were part of a um, debate or discussion called the Judenfrag, which is, in other words, the Jewish question. And the question they asked, seriously, this racist question, was they said, can Jews be both Jews and Germans? Um, this was the development of the idea of European nationalism, this idea of one people, one language, one this, that, and the other. It's it's much more than the Holocaust, you know, this deep anti-Semitic thing that's there from the Inquisition in Spain out to the pogroms in Tsarist Russia. It's a very deep European problem. Rather than deal with this European problem, as I said, from the Balfour Declaration, they said, well, we're going to send um, the Jews out of Europe, which is one solution. The other solution is we're going to kill them all. I mean, that's these are the two uh, legs of the same solution, is basically deciding that, no, Jews can't be Germans and Jews or Spaniards and Jews and so on. Remember that after the reconquest of Spain by Isabel and Ferdinand, the Inquisition demanded that Jews convert to Christianity. Uh, they were called conversos. Um, so this is the history of European anti-Semitism. No parallel anti-Semitism in, in Asia or in Africa, certainly not in Jerusalem or Baghdad, nothing like this um, in this period. Uh, this is a European problem. Germany never dealt with this. After World War II ended and the Soviets liberated uh, most of the concentration camps or the extermination camps, some of them uh, were liberated by the Allies, but the Soviets did the heavy lifting on this. Uh, after that, Germany didn't say, okay, all of you who have been persecuted and all of you who went into exile, please come back. We're going to make serious amends. No, no. What they did was they paid 15 odd years later reparations to Israel. Um, and that reparation was the down payment for Israel's military industry. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the military, in, milit Israeli military industries, IMI. Uh, which is now largely owned by Elbit Systems. Germany paid the down payment for the arms manufacturing inside Israel, but they didn't welcome Jews back in large numbers to Germany. In other words, that final solution continued. Uh, and I want to say that pretty bluntly. Uh, Germany has never really come to terms with that history. The way it's taught in Germany is limited. Um, it's taught as a problem of the of a particular period the Nazi era, not the long terrain of German history and so on. Um, so that's Germany. Just to interject now, as well, this is exactly how we talk about the genocide of indigenous peoples here in Canada as well, is this problem, this mistake that happened in the past that is over and it's finished and it's not ongoing, anything like that. And this is how we kind of whitewash the fact that these systems and institutions are still perpetuated to this day. Correct. You treat the atrocity as an event, not as a process, Right. You, you delimit it. You say it's from it's from 1940 to 1945, and that's it. Uh, it's not part of a long process. It's delimited. Um, very clever way to do it, by the way. Um, blame Hitler for everything and so on. Don't talk about Herder and the intellectuals of the 19th century, you know, who are highly respected and their statues are all over German cities and so on. Don't talk about that anti-Semitism, right? Yeah, or the ways um, that so, the ruling class in like Canada and the UK were totally supportive of Hitler and the Nazis up until it became like uncouth to continue to do so. You started off by asking me about Kate Middleton's photograph. You remember that other photograph of... Uh, later, she becomes Queen Elizabeth II, giving the Nazi salute. Yes. Hog marching around her garden with her cousins, all doing the Nazi salute. I mean, for God's sake, don't forget, this is the Battenberg family. Um, they have deep roots in Germany. And this you know, Nazi stuff appealed to them. After all, they behaved like Nazis in the colonies. You know, the kind yeah. of violence done to people and so on. Okay, so that's one. Secondly... Germany now, so hypocritical, backing Israel to the hilt, so hypocritical, um, out there saying there's no genocide in Gaza. And what I found interesting, um, I thought it was very interesting how the um, Namibian government came in and said, wait a minute, guys, 
you should know better when it comes to um, genocide because you conducted a genocide. They didn't talk about um, the genocide against the Jews. They talked about the genocide of the Herero and Nama people in Southwest Africa, now Namibia, for which they have never apologized or provided reparations. They wiped out, essentially wiped out two, um, two nationalities you know, from the African continent. And, you know, what can Germany say in response? The Namibian president put out a statement uh, after the ICJ ruling. And I thought that was a really interesting move. And most people in Germany would have no idea about the genocide of the Herero and Nama people between 1904 and 1908, um, long before the Holocaust and so on. Very few people would know about that history. But in Namibia, they have not forgotten. So the Namibian president put it out there. I mean, it's crazy uh, that, you know, on the one side, there's all this talk in Germany about, you know, democracy and the rise of the far right and so on. And then the lack of democratic space to have even a discussion about what's happening in Palestine. I mean, the Max Planck Institute, highly respected academic research institute, fired the Lebanese-Australian anthropologist, Ghassan Hajj, because Ghassan Hajj on Facebook, for God's sake, it's his private uh, you know, space to say whatever he wants. On Facebook, he had the gall to say that this um, you know, war against the Palestinians is outrageous, and he, he used measured language. He was fired by the Max Planck Institute. Then they came out and said they had warned him when there was no evidence of warning. He released a statement saying, I'm hearing impaired. So you couldn't have phoned me because you know that I, I can't talk on the phone. You'd had to have sent me a text, a WhatsApp or an email. I don't have any record of any warning from you. So you're lying now in your public statements. This is Germany. It's a highly respected government supported research institute, you know, behaving essentially like a mafia gangster thing. You know, you, you know, you know, I'm going to just whack you. You know, you you said something about Palestine. Whack. You're gone. Um, this is where German culture is now. And it's pretty pathetic. You know, I mean, I look at that and I think, wow, man, I mean, you know, what standing will you have now? The Green Party is perhaps more to the right of the uh, of the Christian Democrats now on Ukraine, on Gaza, on everything. They are, I don't know what, why they call themselves a Green Party. They are, they are increasingly becoming a, a party of the, of the establishment right. Um, the De Linke has going, is going to collapse. That's the party of the left. It's split. Um, you know, highly well-known people like Sarah Wagenek, Seven Dagdalen and so on have left De Linke. And I must say, they have been very good on this issue. So let's see what happens. In the European election, let's see what happens next year in the Bundes election, in the federal election in Germany. I very much hope that some of these new forces are going to wipe out, um, you know, these pretend liberal groups like the Greens and the, the Social Democratic Party of o Olaf Schulz. I hope they get punished in the polls. I mean, look at Europe, okay? In Rochdale, George Galloway yeah. comes in from nowhere on the Workers' Party ticket and wipes out Labour, the Conservatives, wipes out the Liberal Democrats. Why? Because he did two things. The media is saying he converted this into an election on Gaza. It's not true. And also they are doing something racist. They are saying, oh, it's because there's 30% of the electorate are Muslims. In fact, Galloway campaigned on the fact that a child cannot be born in the town of Rochdale. There's no hospital anymore. You can't die in the town of Rochdale. You know, there's no a place for elderly people to go, you know, for hospice and things. You have to go out of the town. Um, there's barely any schools there. 50% of the children there are under poverty. I mean, that's what he campaigned on. He campaigned on that and linked it to Gaza. And he won more s votes than all the three main parties put together. Um, so there's a shakeup going on in the world, okay? I don't think it's going to come to the United States fast enough. It's definitely not coming to Canada soon enough because you don't have the, the platform for that. You know, your NDP is a disappointment, um, despite the fact it's led by a Sardar. And at least I shared that with him. Um, yeah. But, you know, he's completely checked that, out now. He's ready to he's ready to retire soon. No, no, quite right. I mean, you know, you know, you can't you can't smile your way to the 
to uh, you know to pull in people who are disaffected you have to actually have a politics you have to say something to people young people who are radicalized want some sincerity they want straight answers or at least pose the problems problems may be difficult to solve but pose the problems honestly that's what people want they don't necessarily want you to come with a magic wand and fix everything but don't um come in there and and be and lie to people or don't come in there and 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 you know sweep problems under the rug they want sincerity and i don't think in canada sorry to say right now i don't think you have a platform united states certainly not a platform with a mass character but um it will be interesting to see in the uk what happens in the election this year <clears throat> whether other forces can come in and mess things up yeah i i think galloway is a really interesting uh figure to kind of keep our eyes on like you're saying i think we have this kind of like uh, institutional social democratic left as much as you can call it that in in canada and maybe in the uk and america people that are trying to work within the system to make whatever changes and i think have been very conciliatory towards the ruling class and have tried to do things the right way and routinely get all their demands come kind of completely ignored and i think it's been really disaffecting for a lot of people that are looking for someone that's going to really unapologetically champion some of these issues whether they're issues about foreign policy or issues about domestic or economic policy and that's one thing i don't and i don't agree with every single thing george galloway says i think he takes some some really conservative stances on social issues that i don't really agree with but i do think it really was a breath of fresh air and i hope that there's people around the world that are showing that when you take these kinds of unapologetic stances especially when it comes to empire as much as that can create problems for you and and Certainly the ruling class in the in the media establishment and the political establishment will circle the wagons and try and come after you. There's actually a constituency for that. If you really are going to be unapologetically talk about these things. Um, and I hope more people start to learn that lesson. But like you pointed out, there's not really the same platform um, <laughs> available as of now. But I think that's definitely something interesting to uh, to, to continue looking at. And um, I think, yeah, I think talking also where what you're saying as well um people losing their jobs, people, uh, you know, being, being silenced or censored, people self-censoring. I think that's one lesson. We're talking about lessons that other young people are taking away right now, which is that there doesn't seem to be any legitimate way to protest Israel's actions. Um, you know, you can't, uh, boycott, you can't try and boycott or divest or sanction Israel, boycott Israeli products that are made in these settlements. We saw the great March of return, a peaceful protest that went on for months that was met with this total savagery as well. Mm -hmm. You have people in America that are, that are engaging in these kind of electoral campaigns like the uncommitted campaign. You saw the other night at the Oscars, you had Jonathan Glazer give this like very reasonable, moderate statement about not wanting Jewishness and the Holocaust to be hijacked to support the dehumanization of others and this perpetual violence. And each one of these, um, you know, these kind of actions are met with, with denunciation, all kinds of accusations about anti-Semitism. Um, like we said, people are, 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 I think, becoming really disillusioned by that. This kind of tactic is becoming less and less uh, successful. But I think that's another thing that people are taking away. Like, because not only, because, you know, obviously armed struggle and armed resistance is, is a big, apparently that's not allowed, even though under international law it actually is for a colonized people to uh, engage in armed struggle against their colonizers. That's not allowed, but neither is anything else. There's no real, there's no combination of words or phrases you can use. You know, like I keep saying these, these, uh, you know, these pro-Israel kind of people are saying like, oh, you don't use that particular slogan. Don't use that phrase. It's genocidal. It's anti-Semitic. And it's just what, what it comes down to is like the only legitimate way that you can like uh, engage with Israel's act actions is just to shut up, to not say anything, to say Israel has the right to defend itself and to basically just stop paying attention to it. And, um, you know, it's, I, I think that worked for a long time, like we were talking about, but for more and more people, it's kind of got diminishing returns, this kind of strategy. Um, so it's, it's going to be really interesting in the next few months and years to see how that kind of metastasizes in the West, whether it comes to is issues of Israel or other issues of empire or domestic issues or whatever but i think it's just to to you know put a point on kind of what we were this kind of conversation we were having earlier i just do think it has been a really radicalizing uh 
incident. It's had a really radicalizing effect on, on people all throughout the West and around the world. I mean, uh, that this is this is of course true what you're saying. It's it's it has had that radicalizing impact, <clears throat> but it's also true that you know, um, I'm I fear that um, you know there's a kind of demoralization that sets in because you know what is the slogan? The slogan is end occupation and so on, um, and you know unless there's some real um, movement in the region, I'm talking now about Gaza, right? Unless there's some movement in the region that you see, say, the Emiratis, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Syria, you know, Algeria, Egypt, and so on, somehow get involved, um, it's going to be very hard because the Palestinians are in a position vis-a-vis -vis Israel of extreme weakness. I mean, the resistance fighters, they, are, they have been able to prevent the entry of Israeli troops into northern Gaza and remain there. You know, they came, they destroyed, they continue to destroy, but they can't come in because they're getting hit hard. Um, this is not reported much in the media in the West, but, you know, the Israeli uh, military itself has said we are on phase three, which is we're going to stay outside, keep coming in and raid or bomb from the skies, but we're not sending, you know, an entire tank battalion to sit at Wadi, um, at Wadi Gaza, you know, that separates the two parts of Gaza. We're not going to have troops every day patrolling the streets of Jabalia and so on. They're getting hit hard. Um, they're, they're taking casualties. So, yes, the Palestinian resistance is playing a role. It's important. They are being whitewashed in the Western media. But still, they are not powerful enough to move the dial of negotiations. You need more uh, price you know, on the table. And for that, you're going to need um, the other countries, Jordan to say, look, we're going to tear up the peace agreement. Egypt to say, we're going to tear up the peace agreement. Despite the majorities of people in these countries who are pro-Palestinian, and despite the fact that Queen Rania, you know, of Jordan, she made an appearance with Christian Amanpour in October. Very strong hour she spent with Christian Amanpour. She condemned the violence. She condemned Israel. She said it's not about October 7th. This goes back to the Nakba of 1948, perhaps even earlier. She herself is Palestinian, married to the King of Jordan, and so on. Queen Rania was fierce in October. Then she went silent. And, you know, there was a lot of chatter in the those who follow the Middle East and even in Jordan, saying that, you know, the palace had silenced her because this embarrassed um, the Israelis and therefore embarrassed the United States. And Jordan has this very tight connection with Washington and blah, blah, blah. Last week, she was back on with Christian Amanpour because I think the pressure got to her as well. And she hit hard again, you know, talking about the violence and so on. Or will Abdullah II have the guts to stand with his people and send a message to um, Tel Aviv saying, you know what, a peace agreement, I've got it sitting here and I have a match. Um, well, again, after Queen Rania spoke, the Jordanians airdropped food into Gaza. Ridiculous, you know. Why not, <coughs> you know, um, send a dimash to the Egyptians and say that, you know, we're going to send uh, food into Sinai and we are going to also send a battalion of soldiers and we're going to essentially break through the fence at Rafah and we're going to drive our trucks in under armed uh, protection and let's see the Israelis hit us and then, you know, you escalate further. But none of them are doing anything like that. You know, where is the great Egyptian army sitting on its hands, frustrated? And it's a, it should be a warning to President Sisi because in 1948, when the Nakba was taking place, the Egyptian army didn't move. At that time, a number of the officers, mid-level officers in the Egyptian army were very frustrated. They said, what the hell? You know, we are, um, we've been spending so much money building up this military. We have some very fine aircraft. We have tanks. We have, you know, uh, troops that continue to drill. Why aren't we moving to defend the 750,000 Palestinians who've been ejected, 15,000 Palestinians killed? Well, the Egyptians didn't move because King Farouk of Egypt was an ally of the West and, you know, they were not going to move. Uh, they allowed the Nakba to happen. That had consequences. Four years after the Nakba, a group of military officers who were frustrated around, um, you know, the Nakba 
had gathered together. They created a group called the Free Officers, led by a number of people. One of them was a very charismatic Gamal Abdul Nasser. They conducted a, uh, a coup against King Farouk, threw him into the Mediterranean on his yacht, and then took over the state. And then at that time, in, in at the time in Egypt, they did try to use their military to change the balance of forces, including in 1967 when their forces were really quite badly destroyed by by uh, a preemptive run by the Israeli Air Force. But anyway, the point is, President Sisi should be worried because his generals are sitting on their hands saying, this is happening, this plausible genocide, we're doing nothing, we've spent, you know, um, we've spent millions of dollars uh, on arms, we get aid to build up this military aid from the Saudis and so on. Ridiculous. Why isn't this happening? Let's overthrow CC. I'm just saying, Mr. CC, if he watches your show, um, I think he does. Rob, yeah, Mr. CC, or <laughs> one of his advisors, should be worried here because NASA emerged out of Egypt's betrayal of the Palestinians. And today, Egypt is betraying the Palestinians once more. And will there be another NASA? Yeah, no, it's interesting how some of these uh, these states who have been kind of complicit in both Israel and American war crimes are sitting on their hands while you have like Ansar Allah or the Houthis in Yemen who are the ones that are materially kind of putting skin in the game to try and help uh, Palestinians through this Red Sea blockade. Um, so you see them uh, kind of engaging in this while these, these ex much more powerful uh, sort of client states of the U.S. are, are not doing so. And you have to wonder as well, like in the same way that the Arab Spring began in Egypt, partially because of discontent among the population that Egypt had been kind of complicit in uh, American imperialism and war crimes in the Middle East. You have to wonder if eventually uh, Egypt and some of the and, and maybe Jordan and some of these other uh, nations, whether their complicity or their lack of action is going to spur some kind of other revolutionary moment uh, in, a, in a similar kind of way. I mean, you know, we can only watch because it's very hard to um, to in, in any way be involved in these things. You know, we watch and, and see what the people of the Arab world do. Um, you know, it, it is it is. I mean, I, I would say um, it's one thing um, to post a Palestinian flag on your Facebook. It's another to live under a government which formally is pro Palestinian, but in practice continues to have relations with Israel. And here, it's not an Arab country, but here, Turkey is another example. You know, when this was going on, Recep Tayyip Erdogan uh, held a massive government rally in Ankara. In Ankara, maybe it was in Istanbul. I've forgotten where the rally was. A massive rally, millions of people. They actually didn't wave Palestinian flags. They waved Turkish flags. That was interesting, uh, but it was about Palestine. But Turkey continues to have close relations with Israel, continues to trade with Israel and so on. I mean, I have, um, and you know, at some point we're going to publish this. I have a list here of, um, you know, of the of the trade that the countries of the world do with Israel in terms of arms, and you know, that is going to have to be at some point an issue for people to think about. I mean, you know, I could run down the numbers. You know, who's buying what from from Israel and. And they continue to. Morocco, for instance. Now, they normalize relations with Israel through the Abraham Accords. But they're effectively buying, you know, millions of dollars of, of electronic surveillance equipment, of aircrafts, of explosives, and so on. That's Morocco. I mean, um, I, I want to just take a peek at, at Jordan, which doesn't buy a lot, but buys surveillance equipment. You know, around a million dollars worth of surveillance equipment. It's not a lot of money. For surveillance but but here it is you know um you know there are names of countries with amounts dollar amounts of how much surveillance and military uh, tech you know they buy from from israel i mean india is one of the largest importers of israeli weaponry um it underwrites the occupation a uh, scandalous you know people will be annoyed by this um they are already annoyed but it's the duplicity um in the neighbors of israel whether the Arab countries or Turkey, that's quite shocking. And yes, um, the Yemeni government, led by the political movement Ansar Allah, has taken a strong stand. They said we're going to. And what did the West do? 
just launch bomb attacks on on you know near sana and so on i mean it's crazy um you know not to put to find a point on this but this shows the international division of humanity um ansar allah comes out there this is the yemeni government and says that hey listen um uh, we are not going to permit ships going through the red sea often skirting our territorial waters if they're carrying arms or other equipment to israel it's perfectly legitimate thing icj has said plausible genocide so they say look we can't allow a genocide to continue okay no why didn't antony blinken or one of his underlings fly to sana and talk to them first talk to ansar allah talk to the yemeni government say listen can we work this out we don't want you to be firing at ships no no to barbarians the united states doesn't negotiate they just fire cruise missiles um that's the international division of humanity you know you're a barbarian in the eyes of the west when they don't want to talk to you you remember when clinton fired on the al shifa hospital in khartoum in sudan that's the only hospital on the african continent that produced malaria medicines destroyed why because clinton wanted to distract from uh the revelations about his affair with monica levinsky um no negotiating with the sudanese no conversation hey did you guys have anything to do with the bombing of us embassies in 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 uh, nairobi and in 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 dar es salaam did you were you involved no 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 conversation straight forward bombing that's what they did to yemen i mean people around the world understand this you know maybe in the united states people are not aware that there's something wrong with shooting first and never talking to certain people that there's a, a, a divide in the world a, against some people you can talk forever you know you you try to convince them forever uh, you keep telling the israelis you know please don't kill so many civilians please don't and then you're arming them you know but meanwhile the yemenis say we are going to use whatever means to prevent this genocide you bomb them hello excuse me uh pretty plain and simple where you stand you've taken a made a choice here and you know i always tell people um that you know the yemeni peoples and in particular the ansar allah political movement they have taken a lot of hits from the saudis nothing is going to intimidate them uh, you can bomb them kill them whatever they are going to stand up for themselves that actually is a product of the war that the saudis prosecuted against yemen it is hardened and strengthened um that political movement they are not intimidated by the west so couple of cruise missiles here and there is going to do nothing i mean they continue to be pretty militant and resolute um while i still have you too i'm wondering if you can just speak on how you see china fitting into all this uh i think for people in the western left i think sometimes we look at china and we kind of might have these kind of fantasies about them going back to some kind of more uh a kind of foreign policy where they're exporting revolution the way they used to or the way the Soviet Union used to as we know that's not really how, what their strategy is when it comes to foreign policy um i know they do do deals with israel as well um probably not to the same extent as the west but like there isn't there's a link there um uh, at the same time they have taken quite forceful stances at the UN and other places to talk about why this is happening they've centered the decades long occupation and how unfair that has been and how uh that's the result that's the 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 reason that violence is happening um they've kind of used these kind of stances we talk about Yemen and Saudi Arabia China played a large role in deescalating that and kind of creating and kind of ending that that uh conflict um do you see China somehow playing a role if there's ever going to be a time when this if there is some kind of deescalation that's even possible at this point Do you think China could play a role in that and and what would you what would you see that being? I mean there's a lot that can be said about this. The first thing is that you know China like other socialist projects um sits on the horns of a dilemma. On the one side it has its own state interests that is the interest of its own people who live within its territory, national interests and then it has international obligations. That's the problem with socialist states when they are in power. there has to be a balance between national interests and socialist internationalism sometimes one becomes more uh, important than the other so there was a moment when mao zedong was the premier in china where china went much more towards socialist internationalism uh, building the tanzam railroad in africa um, you know out there fomenting revolution 
group, backing various Maoist groups and so on. And then, you know, there's a spin back to the national uh, agenda. And that was there from before, even from Mao's latter period into Deng and all the way till close to the present. You know, China was loath to get involved internationally. It had been burnt, in a sense, by the Cultural Revolution and the export of Maoism that, that had had a negative impact, they felt, on their own national ambitions. So that contradiction between internationalism and the national is important. Um, Fidel Castro was a very interesting person here because he made the argument that a small country like Cuba for a small country, internationalism met its national interest. This is not the same for a big country like China. You know, one has to understand that scale plays a big role in this. You know, it's not an insignificant uh, point uh, for discussion. OK, so th that's one issue. Secondly, it's true that over the course of the last 10 odd years, China has changed dramatically, uh, has moved from relative isolation to being much more engaged. Now, they have been making strong statements in, in public. It's true, uh, condemning the occupation, condemning this war and so on. But what you haven't seen, and for reasons that I sometimes find unfathomable, is sufficient material support. Where are the Chinese ships entering into Havana Harbor, bringing an electrical power plant, which they could do you know, tomorrow? Um, you know, where are the Chinese ships carrying food aid to Cuba, which is in, in distress, you know, where is uh, where is the Chinese, you know, entering into, let's say, you know, a deal with with um, I don't know, with maybe with Saudi Arabia, who is looking to China for a lot of things and saying, look, why doesn't a Saudi and a Chinese uh, delegation uh, drive into Gaza uh, and let's see what the Israelis do? I mean, why aren't they doing creative things? You know, it's interesting, whatever people might think of of the Russians um, in 2015, for the first time ever uh, since the fall of the Soviet Union. So in, in other words, um, that would make it, what would it make it in uh, 24, 25 years um, when the Russians sent their military into Syria, flying military aircraft. It's the first time in 25 years that the Russians had intervened in that way outside their borders. Um, to defend their port in Latakia. You know, that's the reason why Russia intervened in Syria. But it nonetheless intervened and prevented Obama from bombing um, uh, Syria, you know, uh, in, in the aftermath of 2015. It was impossible after that to have a direct confrontation with the Russians. Well, sometimes I fantasize, Rob, that, um, you know, a squadron of Chinese planes is going to fly over Gaza and uh, create a no-fly zone, you know, that a Chinese aircraft carrier arrives in the Mediterranean and says, we are going to just establish a no-fly zone. Why aren't these things happening? It frustrates me. But I understand that, you know, history moves sometimes slowly and sometimes very fast. And it's happening very fast in terms of the delegitimization of the West, but it's happening very slowly in terms, in terms of the global South um, getting active. One of the ways in which I was very surprised was how South Africa, another country of the South, took um, Israel to the International Court of Justice. That was a huge step forward. Uh, South Africa has done this before. They did this over the apartheid wall about 20 years ago. It's not a big surprise, but this is a major move in the middle of a conflict. Um, but it is going slow. You know, I, I would wish that China or another country with the means would say, look, or, you know, or just China putting a no-fly zone um, resolution at the UN, challenged the Americans, put a resolution in weekly, forced the Americans to veto it we weekly. Uh, why not? That's what the Americans did to the Chinese and Russians a decade ago around Syria. But somehow the Chinese don't do that. Um, you know, they, they just don't do that. And, and I think this is going to take some time to develop. Habits are hard to break, Rob, and, and I think one yeah. has to understand that. Yeah, yeah. it seems like I totally understand the kind of logic behind what their foreign policy has been and not wanting to escalate these things further, not wanting to cross some tipping point into a into a larger conflict. But you do have to wonder sometimes like when the when enough is enough, you know? Um, yeah. So that's the kind of interesting question. 
Uh, anyway, Vijay, I don't want to keep you too much longer. Uh, no. You've been very generous with your time, and I appreciate it a lot. It's always a real pleasure to talk to you. I just had one final question here. I always end with a kind of silly one, so I just had one final question for you, which is, are you, uh, Vijay Prashad, familiar with the concept of gooning, and do you have any words of encouragement for the gooning community at this time? Um, there's a lot of things I don't know, okay? And I do not know what gooning is. And I, I, I would, I'm not even, I'm a little afraid of asking you <laughs> to tell me what it is because, uh, it's like a self help, self care, uh, trend that some men are becoming involved with, I guess. Ah, you mean like grooming, gooning? A little bit like that. Yeah, it's a little bit like that. Well, I am the worst person to give any self-help advice um, for the following reasons, which I'm perfectly happy to share with you. One of them is that I have never taken care of myself effectively or properly, um, yeah, both same. my mental health and my physical health. So I, I, I know the I'm, yeah, no, I regret it. I'm not proud of it. I'm not, I may be smiling when I'm saying it to you, Rob, but I'm not proud of it. I, I actually would encourage um, men in particular to take care of themselves. Why in particular? Because masculinity is such a weird thing. You know, it makes you have this idea where I don't need to, I can just get out of bed, um, you know, put on my sweatpants, go out and I, and I think I look great. You know, um, <laughs> you know, it's a very bad, bad thing. Uh, take some care in your presentation of yourself. You know, uh, I think that's important. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, against a little bit of care. Uh, not only for oneself, I think that might provoke narcissism, but care also for people around you. Uh, sensitivity is okay, you know, um, uh, to to feel for others and, and be kind to people is not a bad thing. I mean, yeah. I'm a huge proponent of kindness, Rob, huge proponent yeah. of kindness. So, yeah, okay, if that's gooning, <laughs> I don't even know what it is, but if that's gooning, um, maybe I feel that it's a good thing if it's there on the table. <laughs> I, I learned about this concept from uh, Norman Finkelstein, actually, which, in, interestingly enough. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay. VJ, thank you so much for joining the show. I really do appreciate it. It was fantastic to talk to you again. And uh, yes. well, I hope you later, we'll do it again Rob. next year. That would be amazing. I look forward to that. Okay. Take wonderful. care of yourself. You too. Yeah. Thank you very much.